Well, welcome to Christ Church. We're grateful that we get to worship with you this morning here in person and online. My name is Reverend Mike. Now, if you are new with us here at Christ Church, we would love to connect with you. An easy way to do that is through filling out one of our online connect cards. You can find the online connect card at the top of our webpage. It is at mychristchurch.com. Well, just a couple of weeks ago, we had Mike Lipta here. Mike was sharing with us about the land of Israel. He was sharing with us about Jerusalem as well. Now we are preparing for our trip where we will go to the land of Israel and Egypt as well. Today, we have a table out in Scripture Hall. If you would like to get more information about that pilgrimage, also at that table, we have people who have taken the pilgrimage before and they would love to answer any questions that you have. In just a couple of weeks, our Building Bridges Pro uh, group is going to have a soul food lunch. They're going to have barbecue. They're going to have a great speaker there. And also, it's just going to be a time to build relationships. If you're interested to find out more, you can go to mychristchurch.com slash events. Well, last week, we had our first ever student conference, and God moved in some incredible ways. We have a video to show you. Take a look. Church, let's pray as we begin worship this morning. God, we thank you for all that you're doing. We praise you. That's the reason why we are here today. We thank you that you are an eternal God, a God who was, is, and will be. We pray that you fill this place with your Holy Spirit fire today, and we pray it through Jesus' strong name. Amen. Christ Church, stand, and let's worship. Parted the raging sea 
just a moment, we're going to collect God's tithes and our offerings. We encourage you to give online. You can do it at mychristchurch.com slash give. We also have an electronic giving kiosk out in Scripture Hall. And as always, you can give here in person. We have bowls in the front, in the back, and in the balcony as well. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you that your presence is here in our midst. We are grateful to worship you. We worship you now through your tithes and our offerings. Will you bless everything that's gathered in order that people may be connected with Jesus? We pray through his strong name, amen. You may now bring God's tithes and your offerings. Sing it together. You are here. You are here. Moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, turning lives on.
I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Yes, you never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Yes. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Come on. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You're always at work in our lives. Thank you for being here this morning. Church, give him your praise. Our Lord and Savior is in this place. Lord, speak to us through your word this morning as we look to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. During the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time, and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Go ahead, take a moment, greet one another, and then please be seated. is good all the time. time. Before I get started today, I want to just add a couple of thoughts to what Mike shared with you. Uh, We are going to make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land in January of next year. We're going to be going to Egypt and we're going to Israel. The new brochures are out right underneath the staircase You can get a brochure. Those of you who are online, let us know. We'll mail you one. But I want to challenge you, ask you to consider something. You know, we all go on vacations and we do all kinds of things and we go all kinds of places. A pilgrimage to the Holy Land is an investment in your spiritual life. How many of you have been on a trip with me to the Holy Land? Just raise your hands tall. Look around, folks, so you can see them. Ask any one of these people. That's how good I feel about this. Ask any one of these people about the impact that this pilgrimage had on their life. You will never be the same. You will never read the Bible the same. And your entire perspective will shift. This is an investment in your spiritual life. I would just like to ask you to pray about joining us for this pilgrimage. And I would really say, some of you say, well, I may do that later in my life. I'm just gonna be very frank with you. The earlier you can do this in your life, the better, because it will change your life for the rest of your life. So if you can make this happen, please consider it 
ask God, and if you can make this happen, I, I wanna recommend it in every way. All right, We're kicking off a new series today. When you live in a log cabin, like Melissa and I do, string trimmers are an important part of your life. Now, you, you might call them weed eaters, but weed eater is actually a brand. It, it, a string trimmer is what we have. It's like we call tissues Kleenex, but Kleenex is actually a brand. We call soft drinks Cokes, but Coke is actually a brand. String trimmers are really important out in the woods, and you need a string about the width of my little finger because there's some nasty stuff out there. Everything in my cabin competes for my cabin. The bugs want my cabin. The rodents want my cabin. The forest wants my cabin. The poison ivy wants my cabin. So we have about, I don't know, a little less than half an acre of yardish. You know, kind of yardish, the sun gets at it about an hour a day. So we've got about a half an acre. And so I just battle that. I just battle the perimeters all summer during the growing season. Well, a couple years back, I got the old string trimmer out. First day of spring, hadn't had it out. Opened the garage up. You know that feeling, you're kind of in it. You know, I, I'm, I'm dressed from head to toe because we've got poison ivy everywhere and I get poison ivy. So I'm just all dressed, I'm ready to go. Get the old string trimmer out. And before long, I've been there maybe 30 minutes and there's not much work happening. In fact, there's not anything happening other than me getting frustrated. And, and so what I do when I was young, I used to just quit. And I'd just get mad and I would just quit. But now I'm older. Quitting involves extra walking because you're gonna have to leave and eventually come back. So I just sit there now and I think through the situation. And I thought, okay, this string trimmer is half full of gasish that I put in maybe last summer. And it's been sitting there all winter. I bet you the fuel's in a bad mood. And I bet you my fuel's bad. And so I thought, let me give it a shot. So I took it to the country recycling place. I poured it on the ground. And, <laughs> and I let it all drain out of my gas tank. And I got some good hot fuel, threw a little bit of that two cycle oil in there. Spun it off, took a whiff. Let me tell you something, man, that stuff was hot. Poured it in that weed eater, shot that button about six times, fired that thing up, and in 30 seconds, that thing ran like new. My weed eater was fine. My string trimmer was fine. Just had bad fuel. I firmly believe a lot of Christians have just gotten used to bad fuel. I think a lot of Christians have just gotten used to their engines not starting. Or when they do start, they just sputter the whole time. I think a lot of Christians have gotten used to not getting much done for the Lord despite their good intentions. So the question is, if God has some hot gas, available for our spiritual motors. Do we want it? Do we really? Because you do understand that once my string trimmer started, I had three hours of misery ahead for me. I was in there fighting the woods for three hours. If God really had something incredible for you, if God wanted to super fuel you, would you want it? In this act series, we're gonna look at what it would take to get our Jesus engines fired up. What's it gonna to take to get the bad fuel out, to clean things up, to get the good fuel in, and what's it gonna to take to get running on all cylinders? And once we are, what's God expect us to do? Acts is a sequel to the Gospel of Luke. We know that the Greek is excellent and the style is identical. Acts is part two, Luke is part one. 
Luke was Paul's personal assistant. He's an eyewitness to some of the events. He witnessed others. He, he shifts in and out of second and third persons. Main character of Acts is the Holy Spirit. The theme is the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when you get down to the end of Luke, it kind of ends oddly. Peter is staring into an empty tomb wondering what's happened. We really want Peter to do better than that. But he's not. He's staring into an empty tomb wondering what happened. Then Luke shifts to a conversation between a risen Christ and two discouraged disciples who are headed out of town. And when Jesus breaks bread, they recognize him and it said their hearts were strangely warmed. Clearly things are heating up. Jesus then charges the disciples to take the gospel to all nations. They had to wonder how they were gonna do that. He promises the Holy Spirit and then he's taken up into heaven. Luke concludes with the disciples all back in Jerusalem with great joy and anticipation. So Acts opens up with the only 120 Christians in the world meeting together in an upper room. And I love their strategy. Their strategy is to stick together, worship God, be obedient to Jesus, and just see what happens. Guys, this is still a good strategy. Just worship God, be together. Live in obedience to Jesus. Just see what happens. I hope there's anticipation when you come to church. Just to see what's gonna happen. You could have been anywhere today. You don't have to be worshiping with us online. You don't have to be here live. You could have done anything. But you chose to be here. You have put yourself in position for God to speak to you. You have put yourself in position for something really good to happen, and there's anticipation hardwired into that. Verse one, dear Theophilus, we don't know if Theophilus uh, was a person or kind of a, a pseudonym, but Theos, God, Phyllis from Phileo, so friend of God, lover of God, Theophilus, lover of God. My historical hypothesis is Theophilus is not the guy's real name, but he is writing to a Roman official. He writes to kind of let him know what happens after Luke. He presents Christianity in the best positive light to the Romans because we're about 35 years after the reported events here by time we know that Acts shows up. So the Romans have started persecuting Christians. Clearly Luke's not trying to make things any harder for them. And then he's also arguing that the church is literally carrying on the ministry of Jesus. You know, we often hear that the church is the body of Christ and we think of that metaphorically, but actually it's not a metaphor, it's literal. We are the presence of Christ on the earth until Christ returns. He left, he left it with us. He left it with us. We are the hands, we are the feet of Christ on the earth. Dear Theophilus, in my first book, I told you about Jesus did and what he taught. Verse three, during the 40 days after his crucifixion, Jesus appeared to the apostles and proved he was alive. At one of the meetings, at a meal, he said, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you what he promised. 40 days is a common measure of, of, of biblical time. It can mean 40 literal days or kind of like more than a month, less than six weeks. But I like 40 days here. Uh, Luke reports that Jesus made numerous appearances. This would be after he is crucified and dead, after the resurrection, before he ascends, went up to be with God. There is a block of time, 40 days. And during that time, Jesus appeared a lot. And if Luke doesn't seem to be working real hard to prove this, it's really simple as to why. Because plenty of people would have still been living when this came out who saw it with their own eyes. When you got eyewitnesses, you don't have to go out of your way to prove something. You got people that were there, people that saw it. They're collaborating witnesses in this. So Luke's not working real hard to prove Jesus was alive because people saw it and you can still ask them. And Jesus told the disciples to stay in Jerusalem 
until the Father sends what he promised. Obviously, the disciples are free to go anywhere they want. They're free to do anything they want. But Jesus is saying, if you want everything God has for you, you need to stay here. And you need to stay until God's promise is fulfilled to you. Likewise, we can all go anywhere we want. We can do anything we want with our time and with our resources. You don't have to attend Sunday worship. You don't have to come to Bible study going deeper on Wednesday. You don't have to be in a connect group. You don't have to read the Old Testament with us this year. You don't have to serve others. You don't have to witness. You don't have to tithe. But if you want everything God has for you, we must live in obedience. Living in obedience puts us in position to receive everything God has for us. Verse five, John baptized with water, but in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's no way that anybody had any idea what this meant. There's no way. Now, everybody knew what John's baptism was, but this baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's no way they could have known. John the Baptist is the first prophet Israel have seen in 400 years. Does anybody remember a time in your life when you heard your first good preacher? You know, a lot of people kind of grew up in, in, in churches and stuff where, you know, they're just, there was faithful preaching, but maybe not riveting preaching. And, and when they hear their first really good preacher, it's, it's kind of like this thing they, they'll never forget. Well, John the Baptist is like the first good preacher Israel had seen in 400 years. This dude lights it up. This guy would have been viral. I mean, nobody was doing what he did. So John is not just preaching, but he's holding invitations and he's baptizing people. Jews didn't believe they needed to be baptized. They were descendants of Abraham. And they believed that if a Gentile wanted to become a Jew, they called that a proselyte, they needed to be baptized, but they didn't believe that Jews needed to be baptized. John the Baptist argued that if we claim to be God's people, we must individually repent of our sin. Not just once a year on the Day of Atonement, we must individually repent of our sin, which is kind of pouring out the old gas. We must be baptized, which is pouring in the fresh gas. And we need to offer evidence of our repentance by changing the way we live, which is letting the motor run. John heated things up. But Jesus promised, even as good as that all was, things were gonna get even better. Things are gonna get even better. There is optimism hardwired into Christianity. Christians should be the most optimistic people on earth. It should be a defining characteristic of people of God. We believe that our sins can be forgiven. We believe lives that were destroyed can be restored. We believe that purpose and peace can be found in this life. We believe that prayers are answered and nothing is too difficult for God. We believe that miracles happen and we believe that when it's all said and done, heaven awaits. I saw a bumper sticker once. It said, I can't wait until tomorrow because I get better looking every day. I like it. That's how Christians ought to think. Man, we got nothing but great things to look forward to. And because we know that good things lie ahead, we can effectively and optimistically navigate the challenges of life and do so so successfully, we can help others navigate as well. We are the people of a future and a hope. Hope, what an incredible thing. Between 1989 and 1992, my family lived in Manchester, Georgia. Zach was five, Lydia was one, Melissa and I were Younger. <laughs> we had heard God's call. We left everything we knew to follow Jesus in the ministry. 
I enrolled in seminary at Emory University in Atlanta. I served two churches, the St. James and Calibut Springs United Methodist Church. The biggest of the churches was St. James. Calibut Springs had six people on my first Sunday. I brought four. <laughs> my first Sunday at the big church, St. James, we had 44 people. 22 were in the choir behind me, 22 were in front of me. It was like a preacher sandwich. <laughs> I'd say it took about 25% of the capacity of the sanctuary, so if you could kind of imagine a sanctuary this size, we would have had one section with some people in it. It was just kind of depressing. And on my very first Sunday, we had those 44 people. I was there three years, that's as good as it ever got. <laughs> it's as good as it ever got. The youngest member in our congregation was 66 years old. Well, the youngest member not related to me was 66 year old. Her name was Sarah Ruth Meadows. I called her the youth group all three years that I was there. <laughs> in my three years at St. James, we celebrated no births. We conducted no weddings. And I officiated over 20 funerals. We received two new members in 1990 and they quit. 1991, we received a whole new family, and they quit. And I couldn't blame them, because were I not hired to be there, I would have quit too. It's really difficult to pastor a church you would have never attended. And it's really difficult to watch a church die on your watch when you feel like God called you into ministry. It's just tough. I also served as the youth director at, Manche <coughs> at Manchester First United Methodist Church on Sunday evenings. I took a full seminary load for three years. I navigated a three-hour round trip to Atlanta three or four days a week, according to the semester. I coached Zach's Dixie Youth Baseball team, and I played competitive softball all over Georgia for three years with Charlie Will Rose Sonoya Express. It was not a sustainable schedule. I remember on Sundays, I would play softball maybe three hours away. We'd play all day on Saturday in the Georgia heat and my knees would just be busted up because you're playing on red clay and, and anytime you slide, it just took a chunk out of you. And I remember preaching on Sundays. I would get back. We may not get done on a game till 11. Be a two-hour drive back home. So it's one o'clock, and then you never go to sleep. And I just remember preaching on Sundays. I'm, I'm tugging at my pants because my knees are both busted, and, and they keep coagulating into my, into my pants. You know, I'm just kind of tugging. Church would get over. I'd get in the car, drive back, play the rest of the tournament. Absolutely unsustainable. And finally, exhaustion just set into my bones. And I began to wonder if we were gonna make it. You ever just wondered if you were gonna make it? You ever think to yourself, you wouldn't bet on yourself? Yeah, that's where I was. We were barely living off of student loans. It cost way more to attend Emory than the whopping $11,000 a year I made from the churches. Once a month, I got paid whether we needed it or not. And we went to Pizza Hut and ordered a large cheese pizza, a pitcher of Pepsi, and played three songs on the jukebox. That was as good as it got. I mean, that's as good as it got. We did pay, play Bob Seeger Turn the Page every month, which was better than it could have been, but it was still as good as it got. My last year, I suffered a series of kidney stones. As we neared the home stretch, we were running on flickers and faith and fumes. On a lot of school nights, I wouldn't get home till after 11. And I often could not remember making the drive. Have you ever done that? You, you just do not remember making the drive. But I always remember that when I turned into that Manchester Mill Village, and I pulled into the driveway of our parsonage at 16 Johnson Avenue, Melissa would always have a candle burning in the window, always. And I couldn't wait to see that candle. It wasn't just a candle, it was hope with a wick. It reminded me that this weary season would not last forever. It reminded me that God had called us into this and if he called us into this, he was gonna get us through it. 
And it reminded me that God had better things ahead. And better things sounded really, really good. Maybe you're running on flickers and faith and fumes right now. And maybe God sent me here today to tell you this weary time will not last forever. God has you. God has your situation. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. The simple anticipation of better days is the stuff of hope. That's what Jesus gave to his disciples who had been through so much in such a short time. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse six through eight, the apostles asked Jesus, when are you gonna free Israel and restore our kingdom? And Jesus said, God sets those dates and they're not for you to know. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. Can I paraphrase what Jesus said to the disciples? You boys are dumber than a bag of hammers. (laughs) But when the Holy Spirit comes, all that's gonna change. You don't get it now. But when the Holy Spirit comes, you will. Right now, you think I came for our time, but you will understand I came for all time. A lot of people today think if Jesus came back, He'd have a lot of comments about the Democratic or the Republican Party in America. Let me tell you what Jesus would talk about. The kingdom of God and the forgiveness of sin. Jesus had to look at his disciples and think, boys, you're killing me. But when the Spirit comes, when the Spirit comes, boys, your engines aren't really running yet. Oh, they sputter. And every now and then, maybe I can get them started but there's some sizzling, hot, new gas coming your way real soon. And things are gonna change. And he says, and I will give you power to tell people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. The power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost gave the first Christians the ability to effectively and vocally Be witnesses to Jesus Christ, period. Read it. That's what Jesus promised. When the Spirit comes, you will have the power to be witnesses to me, vocally. You may say, Pastor, I disagree. You don't have to say anything to be a witness. You just have to live for God. Okay? If that's your position, may I humbly ask a question? How many people did your undercover witness lead to Christ last year? Or the year before? Or the 10 years before that? When my dad was a young pastor, he suggested that his country church needed to go to the big city, which was Pinckneyville, Illinois, And they needed to witness in the streets, witness in the schools, and go to the bars and share the good news of Jesus. One of his church leaders couldn't tell the difference between that and the worst idea he had ever heard. And the inevitable conflict that emerged, he told dad everything wrong about dad's plan. And dad looked at him and said, what is your plan for reaching this region for Jesus Christ? And the guy said, I don't have one. And dad said, I like mine better. (laughs) Don't tell me you're spirit filled in the Pentecost sense of the word if you don't have the power to be witnesses. Verse nine, and not long after that he was taken up into the sky and he disappeared into the clouds. The, The Greeks really like watching a balloon. Have you ever watched a balloon go all the way up into the sky till you can't see it anymore? He just, they, did, they just watched and he just went. There's a Trinitarian swap of sorts that happens after the ascension. The physical presence of Jesus of Nazareth is replaced by the omnipresent Holy Ghost. Jesus in the flesh could do miracles and preach and teach and lead and have lunch with you, but he could only be in one place at one time. The Holy Spirit had no human limitations. 
And if the gospel were to spread beyond Jerusalem, it would need the all-encompassing wind of the Holy Spirit to blow the wildfire of Christianity to the ends of the earth. Yesterday, Zach and Sarah and Eli and the new one came over. And we dipped down into our woods, which is about 30 feet below our cabin, in a floodplain, and a lot of trees fall. And we decided, we, me, decided that we needed to cut a bunch of the wood up. We were gonna haul any good wood up to the top where we have bonfires, and we were gonna burn junk wood. We got a fire started. I tried to start a fire, it didn't go well. Melissa got the fire started, so I just had to shut my mouth and realize that she was in charge of the fire. But we got the fire started and we were burning junk wood and, and we hit a point where things just weren't going real well. It just, just needed some extra. And I figured something out a while back by watching one of those shows where they make metal things, where they make metal blades like forged in fire or something. They, they do this and to get those fires hot, they always got these things that shoot air on the fire and it gets the fire super hot. Well, I remember thinking to myself a couple of years ago, well, I don't have one of those, but I got something better. I've got a leaf blower. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You've never lived until you've had a bonfire and a leaf blower in your hands. <laughs> Woo! Man, that fire needed a little help got in there with the leaf blower, shot that in that core, and it got hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And for long, that whole thing, it burned more in five minutes than it would have in two hours. It was awesome. (laughs) You wanna know what the Holy Spirit does? Sticks that leaf blower in your flickering fire and heats you up and puts you to flame. That's what the Holy Spirit did in Acts. It fired up the church. It took a bunch of scared, fearful disciples hiding out in an upper room and filled them with the Holy Spirit and so supercharged them that they went into the whole world, their entire world, and shared the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost wants to do in you. And that's what the Holy Ghost wants to do in me. And it says, and suddenly two white-robed men stood among them. Why are you standing here looking at the sky? Jesus has been taken into heaven, and one day he will return. The second coming. The second coming reminds us that time and space are going somewhere. I do not believe the cosmos was formed by impersonal and random chance. I don't believe that. I believe the cosmos was formed by the divine intelligence of an omnipotent God. And I believe that you are not an accident. I believe that you were created in the image of God. And I believe that God has a wonderful plan for your life. The doctrine of the second coming reminds us that time and space are going somewhere. God is in control. And it really concerns me that the second coming is is never mentioned by theological moderates or liberals these days. And and when it in is it it seems to be associated with fanatics or, or religious extremists. The second coming is and has always been a central tenet of orthodox Christianity. It is a pitch right down the middle. And the problem is it hasn't come yet. But it's going to. You say, Pastor, it's been 2,000 years. How do you know? Let me tell you how I know. I want you to imagine somebody made you 1,000 promises and they kept 999 of them. What do you think the chances are they come through on that last promise? I'm gonna say they're really, really good. You wanna know why? Because their character has already been established by the fulfillment of the first 999. You can bet on that one. Every promise in the Bible has been fulfilled. It is the one outstanding promise. But Jesus made it, and Jesus is not just a promise maker, Jesus is a promise keeper. And if he said it, I believe it, and it will be so. 
The other thing you need to understand about the second coming, it's not a fearful doctrine. When I was a kid, there were a lot of second coming movies and they tried to make them suspenseful. You know, it's, it's kind of like where the Bible meets Alfred Hitchcock and it was a little weird. And so it, I was always kind of afraid that Jesus was gonna come back like in the middle of basketball season and ruin the whole thing. And so, <laughs> and so you know, I always kind of had these odd thoughts about that. But I need to tell you, the doctrine of the second coming isn't something to fear. The doctrine of the second coming is the doctrine of hope. Luke writes to a persecuted church under Nero. It was hard every single day to be a Christian. And the doctrine of the second coming was reminding them, Jesus is watching. He knows your pain. He knows your fear. He knows what you're going through. And he will come back for you. It's a doctrine of hope. It's when the buzzer sounds and Satan loses and God wins and all of us Christians get to cheer in the stands. We'll be happier than Bengal fans were yesterday. <laughs> and that brings us back to that candle in our parsonage so long ago. If you've ever spent much time in central Georgia, you know how hot it gets in the summer. Sometimes that candle just be burning brightly. And sometimes in the summer, unless it had the window open, man, the humidity and the breeze was just trying to suffocate that candle. Sometimes it may feel like our Christian light is just barely flickering. And maybe sometimes it is. But what if our lights were designed to burn much, much brighter? What if God desires to fuel you up with some sizzling hot gas and offer power for Christian living beyond anything you've ever experienced before? What if everything that you've experienced in your life to this point, even the best of it, has really just been a hint, a rumor, a taste, a glimpse, or an echo of everything God has for you? What if the best is really yet to come? And that brings us to our closing question that was our opening question. If God has more power available for your Christian life, do you want it? If your chainsaw could run, would you want it to? You say, well, isn't that obvious? Not really. Jesus ran into an infirm man and he said, what do you want? And the idea was anybody would have said, well, that guy wants to be healed. And Jesus kind of said, well, do you? You do realize if you're, you're healed, you're going to have to get up and do something. You do realize if you're healed, there's going to be a little bit of responsibility required from you. You do realize if your chainsaw works, somebody may occasionally expect you to cut down a tree. Sometimes it's pretty easy having a broken chainsaw. You don't have to do anything. I'd sure be getting a lot done if it wasn't for this chainsaw. What if God has more for you than you've ever imagined? And what if it's available through the power of the Holy Spirit right now? Would you want it? Would you want it? I'm gonna invite you to join me over these next few weeks in Acts. I'm gonna invite you to open up your heart as we testified to with these red stones at Christmas. Remember the red stones? They were a commitment that you want to be everything God's created you to be, that your heart's open to God. Red stones are here if you haven't done this yet. The jar's here. Every stone in that jar, somebody, one of you, put that in there. That's your stone. If there's some other stones on top of it, it's because God's answered some prayers since then. But this stone... Part of that was saying, God, I give myself to you. But a part of that is saying, Lord, I open myself to whatever you want to do in my life. Are you ready to open your life up to Christ? Are you ready for some fresh hot gas? Are you ready for Jesus to fulfill that sizzling promise he made to his disciples? Are you ready for the Holy Ghost to enter your life? If you are. 
See you next Sunday. Stay open and just see if the best days of your life aren't still to come. Let's pray. Great and mighty God, you're so incredible. We, we confess, dear Lord, that sometimes it's just pretty easy thinking our chainsaws don't work. Don't have to do much, sit around a lot, drink a lot of coffee. But Lord, you didn't, you didn't create us to be powerless. When Jesus left this world, he told his disciples before then, it's gonna be better off for you boys that I leave because the Holy Spirit's gonna come. Dear God, we open our hearts to what you have for us. We're gonna tarry in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we can't wait to see what you're gonna live, what you're gonna do in our lives. So may we live in hope and anticipation of the great about to be that was promised by Jesus in the form of the Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' strong name and all God's people said, amen. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all alone. Let's sing it out, church. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then all the third at break of dawn the sun of heaven rose again oh trample death where is your sting the angels roar for Christ the
Church, as you go from this place, carry that power of the Spirit with you. We will see you next time. Go in peace.